Thank you very much for the possibility of being here, and I would like really to uh, congratulate to the organizers. And uh, when you receive this task to be the first speaker and deliver the first lecture, then you have great ideas and you say, I will do something fantastic because a good start is mandatory for a good conference. And then you look a little bit to the program, the detailed program, you see how famous and big speakers are speaking after you and you say, oh my God, it will be difficult. So let's stop doing it in the right and normal way. Let's do something uh, interesting. And uh, okay, so let's see. I have no conflict of interest, first of all. And then my liaison with the Dupuytren disease uh, is a very long one because I remember in historic times when I took the European Diploma Examination in 97 uh, in Bologna, uh, one of the most important parts of my examination, the oral examination, was on Dupuytren disease and Philippe Safar at that time was a very hard guy and asking me about the importance of check reins in PIP joint contractures due to Dupuytren disease and started a very, very nice uh, connection with me and Dupuytren and then I had the chance when I became the examiner of the European Diploma and then the head of the uh, examination committee that uh, people like Dupuytren disease. And when you speak about hand surgery, Dupuytren disease is always there. And uh, candidates for the examination were good in Dupuytren disease related questions. And we examiners, when we wanted to help candidates, we always asked something about Dupuytren disease. So Dupuytren was something uh, jolly joker, just like football and politics, everybody's an expert. So, <laughs> It was nice, and uh, then I had the chance having uh, the big explosion because of the collagenase and because of Pfizer, and uh, then everybody was speaking uh, about Dupuytren all around the world, and that time I was the Secretary General of uh, FASH uh, and IFSSH, and we really, really had a lot of, uh, of uh, chance uh, to leave those times. But uh, after that, uh, I decided now I will present you a non-randomized and absolutely non-scientific uh, review. Uh, you, and uh, as every review, it will start with collecting data. And as I'm traveling a lot, and I was involved in several different uh, uh, meetings and uh, everywhere, I will present you some data I've collected, the most interesting data. So when I've asked in all around the world about Dupuytren disease, I had a lot of different uh, uh, answers. For example, the wicking disease, I'm not interested in my country, I've never seen it. For others, it's the most important income in their financial background because Dupuytren is a very good thing to make money. And when asking about uh, uh, Etiology, real etiology, uh, you may think uh, it's, it's a joke, but uh, you will find doctors uh, who still think that it's a contracture of the flexor tendons, and uh, you will find other doctors who knows exactly the histological background of the disease. And uh, when we discuss about diagnostic, data show that the majority of people say, what the hell is diagnostic? Is it a problem? You just have a look and you see it's a Dupuytren disease. And you have others who say, no, no, I need histology and I need ultrasounds and I need MRI and I need whatever I want. So it's very interesting when you have things about uh, uh, diagnostic. Once you have your diagnostic, then treatment is coming. But who should treat this disease? And then if you travel around the world and collect data, you will see that there are parts of the world where rheumatologists are treating, and in other parts, GPs are treating. And there are other countries where not only hand surgeons, but specialized hand surgeons on Dupuytren are able to treat this disease. So in some places, it's so important. In other places, it's not important at all. So where to treat? Then it's about another very, very interesting question. Because in some countries, Patient is coming, receiving treatment, is going home in the afternoon or one hour later. In other countries, the patient will stay one or two weeks in hospital related to the treatment of Dupuytren disease. So where is the truth? Where is the midway, three days hospitalization is the ideal or what? So when? I've encountered a lot of uh, surgeons, a lot of doctors who say as early as possible because that's the logic, yes? You have a disease, it's early, you go for it, you have to save your patient. Is it good? I have others who said, oh, please don't touch when it's the young uh, disease because you worsen the situation. You have to wait, still there is a contracture. So again, it's very, very difficult to find where's the right way. And then what to do. And when you discuss about what to do, this becomes most interesting and the most important because there are a lot of alternative methods. People are believing more and more in so-called alternative methods. 
And there are others who said, oh, for Dupuytren, surgery is the only way to treat this disease. And it's easy. Why to discuss so much about that? It's, there is a cord, break the cord. What, you can choose whatever method you want and you solve the problem. What to discuss so much on genetics, background and this and that. There is a cord, break it, you will have a happy patient and that's all, it's solved. So why to stay two days and speak about this Dupuytren? Then, of course, another option is, let's make an amputation and then you don't need any treatment of the Dupuytren. Of course, then there are fine and interesting uh, publications and people who believe in the beneficial effect of the light and massage and ultrasounds and meditation because uh, in some cases meditation is very important in, uh, in solving uh, this disease. But if we speak seriously, Alternative methods are existing from radiotherapy to collagenase, which these are not surgical procedures, and they really give us evidence-based data on the good outcome of the patients. And if we speak about surgery, because the majority of the participants are surgeons and we like uh, surgery and we like blood, then we can question if needle aponeurotomy is surgery because there's not too much blood there. But anyway, we consider it surgery, then we can start from needle aponeurotomy to the big blood giving open palm cash technique. Then we know that this is a disease of the fascia. So let's take out, only cut the fascia or take out all the fascia, even using microscopes for taking out all the remnant parts of the fascia and doing three, four, five hour operations with bloodless field released two times and put back and half a day in operation theater because I've seen these kind of operations even from famous hand surgeons who were experts in the field. So when there's a defect, because in sometimes you have a lot of defects, you will find a found data from a simple Z-plasty to big full sickness skin grafts to replace those defects. And postoperative care is another very important topic in discussing about Dupuytren. And I've encountered doctors who said, what about postoperative care? If I do the operation, then patient's going home, moving his hand, using his hand. I do not need any kind of postoperative care. And then I've seen the other side, some dynamic super splinting and some physical therapy machines which look like the uh, commander table in the NASA for the space shuttle. So it was really something super fantastic and sophisticated. And uh, another very interesting thing about complications, because all we are dealing with Dupuytren, we are afraid of complications. So asking people all around the world about complications, you can find doctors who said, what is that? I've never had a complication. Um, if you have a Dupuytren, come to me, I solve it, and no complication. And I've encountered surgeons who say, oh, every Dupuytren is a disaster. I do it for hours and the patient is unhappy and there is a, uh, it, it, always I have injured nerves and tendons and everything. So I really, I, I, I'm about stopping to treat this disease. And uh, another question is uh, prognostic, long term. And healed forever. Surgeons who do the operation, they never have recurrences and there are others who always have recurrences. So we always can find doctors stop because this, this disease cannot be treated surgically because always comes back. And the future. Future is very interesting, what we think about. And it starts from taking a pill and uh, all the disease is gone to genetic surgery when we will take our, all our genes, replace a little piece in that and then the Petrin disease will disappear. So I had some conclusions on this big non-scientific study. And uh, because I have to speak about how Dupuytren is uh, looked all around the world. And I may say you that uh, in the United States, they are clever. They produce and sell the collagenase. Scandinavian cities, they're rich. So they buy the collagenase. <laughs> and they do it and they produce it. France, poor France hand surgeons, they are in a very, very bad shape because all the Dupuytren cases are taken by the rheumatologists who are doing needle aponeurotomy. And finally, a hand surgeon got a Dupuytren disease patient will do immediately fire break uh, uh, operation because this is the only way to prevent uh, recurrences. In Germany, they use radiotherapy because they know a lot about X-rays and they don't like collagenase because they say it's more very expensive for them. And then in UK, they are smart. They are doing a lot of studies, they publish them, and they live very well from that. And in Netherlands, because they have a lot of fat, they use lipophilic. <laughs> so 
This is good. And of course, only on secondary, they uh, organize such kind of scientific events when we can learn what to do in reality with this. And we in Eastern Europe, you know, we are looking to the big brothers and uh, try to learn from them. And we are ready to do whatever they want, if it's cheap, if it's available, and we can earn some money with. So if everything is so unclear, so controversial and so different, and everybody is convinced that his own method he's used to do is the best, and there is no doubt that every surgeon or doctor who's treating a Dupuytren wants to solve in the better way this disease, then how to decide? It's very, very difficult. And I think that the most important thing is that we have to separate things. Because related to Dupuytren disease, as related to all any other disease, there are three big problems, three big pools. One is beliefs, other is knowledge, and the third one is hope. And till now, you have heard about my beliefs on my, my data collection. And there are a few things I know exactly. I know that we really miss evidence-based data, but I know exactly that even if we have evidence-based data, we do not use that in the proper way. And then, of course, I know that we need to work a lot to make a lot of, of studies, a lot of experiments in order to know better the disease. And then we have to speak a common language because that's a big problem in Dupuytren. We don't speak the same language. And as I used to say that FASH and IFSH official language is bad English, we should find a common language for Dupuytren disease too. And of course, the most important, I think, that we organize these kind of congresses for our benefit and we discuss what we as surgeons we like, but we should ask sometimes our patients what they like. And this is why it's great this event because here not only surgeons are discussing, but patients are here and patients can tell their opinion about what they think about our treatments. And what I know is that the collagenase contributed enormously to our knowledge of Dupuytren. Not because collagenase is so good, not because we should treat everybody with collagenase, but because with the development appearance of collagenase, a lot of money was invested in courses and congresses and teaching all around the world where we were teaching not only how to use collagenase, but we are teaching about the etiology and diagnostics and treatment modalities of Dupuytren disease. And what I know is that FASH and IFSSH has a lot of money, if I regard from the point of view of my bank account, because half a million euros and one million US dollars, a lot of money for me, but not for experimental surgery, not for research. And that money should be used in a proper way and now Times are changing, and more and more, the leadership of both two organizations are committed not to collect money. And we agree on the fact that we are not a money-making and money-multiplying machine, but we should give that money for teaching. We should give that money for education, for research. And I know exactly that these kind of scientific events we are here, of course, first of all, due to the hard and strong work of the organizers, have a lot to improve our knowledge. And I know that the most important thing is how we decide. And I know that decision-making is a very serious problem. And decision-making can be rational or irrational. And we every day face this. And if you are looking on evidence-based data about how decision is done, especially medical decision-making, how it's done, you will find a large number of articles. You will find books that describe how medical decision-making is done. And I don't know if you are aware that there is a journal which name is Medical Decision Making and every year there is a congress on how medical decision making is done. And if I want to tell you that the most important slide of my presentation is this, where it's clearly demonstrated that evidence-based data is not everything. Evidence-based data is only one of the three pillars of our decision when we should take a right decision. Because another very important pillar is patients' values and expectations. And the third very important pillar is my individual clinical expertise. How my teacher taught me, how I used to do, how I'm convinced that I should heal my patients. And of course, now the third, these were the knowledge and now the hope. I hope that the enormous effort of our organizing chairman and the committee 
will conclude in a great scientific event in these two days. And finally, I hope that one day a patient will take a pill and the Putrin disease will be gone. And you may say it's a dream and you may laugh, but it was exactly the case with the duodenic ulcer. When I started my surgical career, every day I was operating duodenic ulcers. Today, young surgeons have no idea what it is, only because of a pill. But I know that if this disease will disappear for the benefit of our patients, hand surgery will be poorer with one of the most interesting chapters. And now, on behalf of FASH and the IFSSC, I would like to thank the great job the organizers and Paul, they did, and I wish you a great learning experience here in Groningen. Thank you very much.